The Honourable Member from Charlottetown Belvedere to start today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have risen many times in this House to speak about housing. Um, in fact, this motion was originally tabled in February of this year, Mr. Speaker, um, and it, it speaks to how little has changed in our environment that almost every single one of the clauses in that motion remain as relevant and critical today as they were in February. When we started with this motion, it was to bring to attention how large and complex the housing situation is in PEI and also how critical it is that we can no longer, no longer be the only ones that are standing up in this House speaking about it. Mr. Speaker, housing availability and affordability are a critical part of our provincial economic strength, growth and recovery. That's the opening <coughs> statement on this motion. And we thought perhaps by starting with that we could get our colleagues' attention because we found that talking about seniors sleeping in their cars or people living in tents or having to deal with mold or not being able to afford groceries or medication wasn't working. So maybe if we talk about it from a perspective of economic strength, growth and recovery, then people might sit up and pay attention. Mr. Speaker, the situation with housing and PEI is not new. We've been talking about it for years. The community has been talking about it for years. It's a crisis that's the result of many factors. Rapid population increase, slow and expensive construction builds, long-term rentals being switched to Airbnbs, job precarity pre and post COVID, low wages, low vacancy rates, no meaningful investment or expansion of public housing for more than 20 years. And it is the result of minimal incentive or intervention from either the province or municipalities to provide any legislation that supports tenants as well as landlords or any leadership to get ahead of the situation as it unfolded like a slow motion train wreck. The result is that we have one of the lowest vacancy rates in the country and some of the highest prices for rentals and housing. Our rental rates now are equivalent to Toronto and downtown Vancouver. PEI is no longer a low cost of living destination. We have lost that right to advertise ourselves as a place where you can come and retire and live the good life because you just can't afford to, Mr. Speaker. And on this side of the house, we are hearing about that housing, housing as an issue from every perspective, every single day. We are hearing not just about the subsidies, need for subsidies for seniors and families or for the housing insecure, but how every islander is being affected. And for most, it's not about how it's affecting their investment portfolio. Mr. Speaker, it is not too late to act, but we need bold and decisive action. And that starts with acknowledging that the problem is even real. It is simply impossible to believe, believe, impossible to believe that other members in this House don't hear it too, the way that we do. But we've had those conversations in this House. We've had conversations for years in this House that we're making it up or we're exaggerating. And we will begin to wonder, who are you talking to? Because we know what we're hearing with the people that we're talking to. And just from within my own caucus today, we can share stories about how housing costs are directly impacting families who have no options or choices. Seniors on the housing list for five or six years Seniors who have died before they got called for, for, for a suitable housing. Family of five in a two-bedroom apartment. Families have had to move three times in 18 months and are now thinking of leaving the province because they're never going to find somewhere they can afford. Families with kids living in tents. Social housing tenants living in unsafe, mouldy apartments but who can't move because there is nowhere to go. <clears throat> On this note, right before the Minister of Social Development and Housing was appointed to his current role, he said that people in mouldy apartments could just move somewhere else. Though such, comments, though such comments would normally be disqualifying, I have the floor. I have the floor, Minister. Though such comments would normally be disqualifying, the Premier was seemingly unbothered enough to reward him with the housing gig. In the meantime, rent evictions, where the apartment comes back on the market as a short-term rental or double the previous rent after a coat of paint and some new kitchen hardware, are a pretty common story. And those tenants that lived in that apartment for are left with nowhere to go, Mr. Speaker. This government and the previous government have been reluctant to even acknowledge, let alone act, on the housing crisis. The official opposition released our housing framework in the summer 2018, Mr. Speaker. We were the only ones speaking about core housing needs, about availability, affordability, suitability, the impact of short-term rentals, rent evictions and illegal rent increases. 
In December 2018, I stood in his house and I was called a liar, Mr. Speaker, by the Minister at that time for talking about chronic homelessness and islanders living in tents. And a few days later, the government had to open an emergency shelter at a motel, which is still running today, Mr. Speaker, as a permanent part of the housing solution that this government thinks is appropriate. We were the first caucus to call our housing situation what it was, a housing crisis. In fact, our office worked with a national media outlet to ensure the severity of our housing crisis was brought to the forefront. That's not media that we want to be making, Mr. Speaker, but it's the truth. We followed up with our housing strategy in fall of 2019, which emphasized the critical need to significantly invest in public funded housing. Meanwhile, the previous administration hired Clifford Lee as the Housing Hub Special Advisor in June of 2018, and the current administration kept him on. But we have never been able to report on what, if anything, he achieved on that file of an annual salary of $129,000 until he was let go sometime in late 2019, curiously around the time his contract was made public. And during that time, the critical work of policy development, relationship building and community connections that are necessary to address housing in our province didn't happen. Instead, developers became the loudest voice at the government table. We have to talk about the economics of housing, Mr. Speaker. It's important to understand how an unhealthy housing market adversely affects our economy, and it is right now. We often talk about how we need to grow the economy and pump up the numbers like GDP, but we spend a lot less time talking about the purchasing power of islanders and how money is circulating in our local economy. If you're not hearing about housing, maybe you are hearing from seniors and families who are telling you that they can't afford to live and pay their bills and buy their groceries anymore on what they earn. And housing is a huge part of that story. The PEI Consumer Price Index for September 2020, our back to school month, showed that rental costs increased 12% year over year. The most recent data from August 2021 shows rental costs increasing 8% another year. House prices, per, house prices have doubled in the last five years, doubled, and increased 20% just in the past year, Mr. Speaker. In my district, it's $400,000 for a two bedroom bungalow, Mr. Speaker. I don't think that's a starter home for just about anybody. Affordability for shelter costs, that's housing costs and utilities, should be around 30% of household income as per CMHC. That's always been how it's calculated. We can come up with lots of different ways. We'd like to interpret that, Mr. Speaker, but it's, that's what it's supposed to be. And beyond that threshold, the household is having to make spending decisions with less money. They're having to pick. They're having to choose. Newcomers, returning islanders, youth and families are looking to stay and work here, but they cannot because they cannot find anywhere they can afford or that are suitable for their needs. Housing is not an issue for poor people. The people most adversely affected first are the ones with the lowest incomes, who have the least flexibility, who don't have the money in the bank to be able to pay that extra deposit that someone is illegally asking them to pay. But it is not a poor people issue. Maybe we pay attention when it starts affecting people like us. And that's not the right way to make decisions, but maybe that's the only way we can get your attention. What this Conservative government doesn't understand is that putting a social lens on housing is putting an economic lens on housing. Managing our housing situation while trying to preserve or even increase private profit while failing to prevent and reverse the consolidation of housing into the hands of a few jeopardizes the foundations of our economy. We would not allow or accept that kind of mismanagement of our food or our water. That's why we have Lands Protection Act and the Water Act. So why do we allow it with shelter, Mr. Speaker? Government cannot say that it is serious about the economy if it, if it is letting the housing market run out of control. It is seriously impeding our ability to attract and retain workers, which is unacceptable when we already have and have had a labour shortage that predated COVID and has only been made worse. It is unacceptable when our economic value proposition was we are an affordable place to live because we're not. How has this government's inaction and indifference to our housing crisis made our province a more competitive destination for skilled workers and businesses? Stable housing was a hallmark of making it in the middle class, and it is not anymore for Islanders. Mr. Speaker, there are so many pieces to do that, that, that connect into this housing one, and one that we've talked a lot about in here and in committee, 
is the role of rental supplements, and they are a pillar of that housing action plan, the one that was originally developed by the Liberal government and adopted as is, where is, by this government. Rental supplements, or mobile rental vouchers, they do not create new housing, Mr. Speaker. They just keep people in the housing they have, and everybody should be grateful for that. We are. But do not think for a second that that's creating new housing spaces or addressing systemic issues. Rental supplements are not investments in housing. They're investments in landlords. Not only are rental supplements a key pillar of that housing action plan, but they are frequently misidentified as affordable rental units by members of consistently of the Department of Social Development and Housing who don't seem to be able to understand the fundamental difference between giving money to a landlord and creating a new rental space. This misidentification means that affordable rental units allow government to claim movement on the affordable rental file without actually having to do anything at all except transfer money from one wealthy space to another. The millions of dollars we spend annually on rental vouchers are doing nothing to add housing to our market. They create a terribly precarious dependency for tenants on government without any leverage or power for those tenants to change the circumstances. What do we need to do to actually create affordable housing for that huge space where people have more months than money? The simplest answer is that we need to build new affordable housing. We have done everything. This government and the previous government have done everything they can to avoid building. They have given money to developers, hand over fist. They have incentivized um, building units that are, do not have any conditions on them that will work past 10 years or less. They have thrown away, the, thrown, away, thrown away the definition of affordable and made it be that the market rent can be determined by the landlord and the landlord can choose what to charge instead of it being actually allocated to somebody's income and being based on what they can afford. We need to be clear about what affordable housing is and then we need to provide affordable housing. And this government has chosen instead to leave millions unspent. From the last capital budget alone, millions went unspent in affordable housing. They just did not spend it. And it's not like there is any necessary need, any reason at all why you would say that it wasn't needed. Anything we build at this point, be it two units, five units, 500 units, is going to help. When we have 485 on the, on the wait list, Mr. Speaker, we are never going to catch up. And I do not want to continually be standing in here and having to explain to my constituents how we weren't able to get them housing in the five years they've been waiting because we thought it was better to give that money to developers. You get your chance. I don't think you will. Mr. Speaker, when we tabled this motion last spring, the new Residential Tenancy Act was expected to be introduced. It's now been delayed again and we won't be seeing it this fall. It's perhaps not unsurprising that Cabinet, whose individual incomes far surpass the average in household income on PEI, are so out of touch with the realities of island tenants. It's unfortunate because in the fall of 2018, if my memory serves, Mr. Speaker, the then Minister of Education wrote to IRAC to initiate a review of, of this tenancy legislation. It's been more than a thousand days since then. Sounds a bit like the childcare plan. And island tenants are no better served by this government in that thousand days of waiting. In fact, the official opposition has introduced and passed more housing legislation than the government in this assembly. The new Residential Tenancy Act, if it's not being watered down behind closed doors, would greatly improve the protections available to tenants. It would expand protections against evictions. It would create a right of first refusal for renovated units, and it would provide financial compensation for tenants in certain instances. The new proposed legislation would also make it easier to take enforcement action against landlords who break our housing laws through the implementation of administrative penalties. Right now, Mr. Speaker, there are few consequences for landlords who break the law. They are maybe ordered to pay back illegal rent increases, and over $100,000 has gone back to tenants through the actions of my old apartment in the last few months alone, Mr. Speaker. But that's not a disincentive against illegally increasing rents. It's a disincentive against getting caught. Under our current laws, government has shown little interest in actually pursuing those landlords who run afoul of the law, whether those are illegal rent increases, unlawful evictions, or even discrimination in housing. 
In the new legislation, housing as a human right needs to be clearly expressed, Mr. Speaker. It is a basic human need, and that should always trump profit in a caring society. The new legislation needs to include provisions to allow for a rental registry. A rental registry is a critical tool for our province to prevent illegal rental increases, but this government has stalled on it for 18 months now. And a landlord or housing provider, Mr. Speaker, is responsible for making sure tenants' rights are respected and their housing is free from discrimination or harassment, including by other tenants. I hope to see stronger provisions in this legislation to protect tenants, but Mr. Speaker, I am losing hope. At the, at this government is following in the path of its predecessor. Talk and no action. I think Islanders have lost trust that government is there to actually help them with housing and is standing by watching as their doors close on the opportunities that they may have ever had to be safe and secure in their housing. Mr. Speaker, as you know, I could go on much longer on housing, but I'm going to stop there because I know that there are other, some other people in the House that would also like to speak to this motion. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much.